Hi, uh, this is Tom Nunn. <clears throat> I'm president of Tom Nunn uh, Consulting and uh, happy to be here today. Tom, thanks so much for making time joining us on the Ivy Podcast. Excited about the conversation that you and I had planned, a lot to cover. Uh, but first things first, give us a thumbnail version of your career prior to that. Okay. Um, I started out my career a long time ago. I spent a little over 20 years in multinational banks. Uh, most of that was uh, leading either uh, large operations groups or uh, information technology groups, uh, supporting the bank's uh, Wall Street or global markets uh, functions. Um, it was actually in, um, uh, in the IT groups that I ran uh, for some large banks in the 90s where I uh, became acquainted with uh, IT contractors, uh, more from the buying side. Uh, I joined a, uh, a mid-sized uh, IT staffing company in 2000. Um, I helped grow it to, uh, from about uh, 25 million to a little over 100 million. I left as the president in 2009 uh, after we had sold the company. So I uh, had a terrific run there, uh, very, very, uh, very fulfilling. Uh, shortly after I left, I started my own consulting business uh, later in 2009. I focused primarily on helping professional staffing companies grow. Uh, I focused on what I call 10 best practices of a healthy company, and I'll jump into that in a little more detail uh, later on. Uh, since starting my business uh, in 2009, I've worked with um, a bit over 110 uh, staffing companies uh, uh, all over the U.S., um, mostly small to mids, but then a few uh, very large ones. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, I have served on the, uh, uh, the board of directors for TechServe Alliance. Um, uh, it's a, a national association for IT and engineering staffing companies headquartered in Washington, D.C. Uh, I started there in 2009 on the board and in 2011 was elected secretary treasurer and member of the executive committee, and I still serve in that capacity today. Wow, that's super exciting and very, very diverse and colorful career. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, so having spent quite a few years in talent acquisition and staffing space, and given the work you currently do with your, your own consulting firm, you must research, you, mu you must observe a lot of the different trends that are happening in this space. What are you mostly excited about when it comes to trends in staffing and talent acquisition? What are you observing? What are you mostly excited about? Well, the, 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 the trends that I see are, uh, you know, some of them are, are pretty obvious, the folks that have been in this industry for a long time. Um, uh, you know, the larger buyers of, the, uh, of our services uh, tend to lead us down the commodity path. Uh, with MSP programs and those sort of things. Um, and uh, a trend that I'm seeing there is, um, is companies that are in that business uh, have, have really worked hard to realign their compensation programs, uh, uh, particularly on the account management side so that uh, uh, where they're getting relatively low margins, they can still make a, a decent profit uh, because they've got their cost and compensation structures in line. Um, a very specific trend that everybody is going through right now is uh, demand has probably never been higher uh, when it comes to job orders, requisitions. Uh, no one is uh, crying the blues that they're not getting enough job orders. Um, everyone is um, uh, you know, concerned, if you will, about I don't have enough recruiting horsepower. Um, the average for, for high touch firms that are bringing in relationship type job orders, the average recruiter to sales ratio has gone from maybe uh, one and a half, one and a quarter, one and a half to two or three per salesperson over the last couple of years. So recruiting is getting harder and harder to, uh, to find enough of that. Um, I think the, um, uh, some of the technology uh, innovative trends, uh, innovation trends that I'm seeing is, um, and I spend quite a bit of time talking with, uh, with my customers on this. I have, in addition to some, a, a lot of consulting customers, I also run peer group roundtables that are organized by company size. And, uh, 
every single one of them uh, spend some time talking about their tech stack, talking about some of the automation, some of the things that are, are coming along that they need to uh, stay in touch with. So to touch on a few of those, the, um, the artificial intelligence, things like chatbots, things that are taking very routine uh, tasks that a salesperson or recruiter might do and, and automating it. Um, there are things like Hear Fish and Sense, which are two pretty well-known known tools that are out there that uh, uh, help enhance the uh, onboarding of consultants uh, or the, uh, the, the uh, I wouldn't call it mundane because it's important, but for lack of a better term, some of the mundane keeping up with them tasks and uh, keeping things going. So that's all what they call artificial intelligence. Uh, it's a computer doing the work uh, and that, that certainly makes things more uh, more efficient. Um, also, some uh, uh, some of those tools that help with uh, database integrity. I'm a data person. I've always been a data person, and uh, I can't tell you how often um, I'll work with a company that um, um, I'll say, you know, if you begin to look at this data um, more specifically, uh, particularly if it's high level data. Uh, it'll 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 really help you out as an executive. And then they go and do the work and they say, I can't rely on the data because it's not being input consistently or the data is all messed up. So a lot of work to make sure that, uh, and some uh, AI uh, to help with keeping the database updated and making sure there's good integrity there. Um, Chatbots. Uh, I remember distinctly the first time that uh, I didn't even know I was talking to a chatbot. I was sitting in my car uh, took a call and it was uh, from a person asked me if I was interested in being an Uber driver. And it took me about 45 seconds because I kept on responding. And then the, uh, the what I thought was a human would respond back. And it took me 45 minute, seconds or a minute to realize I was talking to a chatbot. And then I started playing with it. Um, um, uh, but the, the uh, uh, and and I'm a I'm a I know I look real young, but I'm I'm on the older side and older generation, and uh, I'm not a big fan of talking with chat interacting with chatbots. And I, I remember talking with several people on this over the last couple of years, and uh, uh, they said, "Well, Tom, you know you're the older generation. The younger generation, however you define that, are perfectly comfortable talking with chatbots, uh, and that does some of the work." So I accept that at face value. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, I'm actually uh, pretty involved with with uh, uh, with TechServe and some of the things they're rolling out, but they've got a very exciting um, uh, partnership they've got going with a company called Verimark, uh, and it's really uh, making background checks very uh, much more efficient. Um, you know, I do a lot of work with CFO types, and uh, they're always lamenting the fact that onboarding a consultant takes too long, particularly in this um, environment where if it takes three weeks to get a darn background check back uh, because of all the work that has to happen, oftentimes they'll lose the candidate that says, I'll take the offer, but then you, uh, you're too late because it takes too long to do background checks. So the uh, the exciting thing that's going on there is something called a uh, a career passport. And I'm really excited for, for this. I think it's going to take some acceptance on the client side. But what it does is uh, you do a very thorough background check for a consultant. You could do it on an employee. Uh, and that's going to take some time. But then the, uh, the uh, uh, Verimark put something together called a um, career passport and it's blockchain encrypted. Uh, so it might go back 10 years and do all the various background checks. As a consultant, I've got my background check that six months later, I go to another gig and, I've, and, and that employer wants, wants a background check. Well, guess what? You've only got to go back six months if they accept this because it's blockchain encrypted and it can't be changed so that you've only, you, you're just getting an incremental backup. I think that's uh, ingenious. Uh, and if, if, uh, if that helps shorten the, the, the time frame for doing uh, background checks, it's going to enhance the, um, the ability to get, get, uh, get people up to work. Um, I think it's um, also uh, from an innovation perspective, and whether you call this innovation um, or not, uh, I, I, I will. A lot of what I do in my consulting business, and yes, I've got a lot of experience in the uh, professional staffing world with talent acquisition because I've been in that industry for 20 years. But I really marry that up with uh, stuff that's really generic. It's what do you do to build a company? 
Uh, how do you build a company in value? <laughs> you know, a very interesting statistic is uh, at least in TechServe where I, I'm, I'm, I'm very involved, uh, we've got about 325 members of which 80% are under 20 million and 67% are under 10 million. It doesn't take a lot of capital. It really takes some entrepreneurship and some hootspot to start a staffing company. Uh, and you get to that first 5 million. You, uh, it's that much harder to get to 10 and it's that much harder to get to 20. And I would guess that there's only less than 5% of the industry of thousands of companies that are over $100 million. It takes some hard work. So I do something called the 10 best practices of healthy companies. Uh, and I'm going to read these off pretty quickly. Uh, we could spend three more webinars diving deep into those. And, and, and that's not for today. Right. But the 10 best practices of healthy companies um, uh, in a nutshell are uh, they develop and maintain a desirable culture. They follow effective hiring practices. They have effective accountability systems. They have consistent and effective compensation systems that emphasize pay for performance. They develop a high performance leadership team. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that later, I think in the webinar. They use key performance, performance metrics to measure things. They hold productive and compelling meetings. They have efficient and scalable operations and administration, and they have effective planning and goal setting. So I'm sure uh, you'd all agree that uh, there's nothing whatsoever specific to talent acquisition or staffing with those 10 best practices. They're all pretty generic. Uh, but these truly are uh, uh, um, uh, maybe not the only 10, but some of the, uh, the, the 10 most important things for companies to focus on getting better at if they want to go from that 5 million to 10 million to 20 million and, and 50. And then really to do that, you got to throw in a heavy... Um, uh, a, a, heavy, a heavy dose of discipline, because um, these uh, oftentimes uh, take one out of their comfort zone uh, and requires discipline. Um, I also think it's important when we talk about, uh, about trends uh, to talk about uh, re remote work trends. Uh, remote work is, is um, arguably here to stay. Um, everybody was really forced into that at the beginning of COVID. I can tell you from personal experience prior to about February or March of 2020, I could probably count on one hand uh, the, the number of video meetings that I was in. Um, and then I started doing, uh, you know, Zoom and go to meeting and Teams and getting in video meetings. And I'll have to say the first half a dozen of those um, were a little bit, um, uh, took a little bit of getting used to. And now I am just so used to it. And I do 10 or 15 a week. It's cut down on my plane travel. It's made things more efficient. Uh, and I think that's here to stay. I've heard some really, really good things uh, in the, in the uh, staffing industry of uh, salespeople that say, you know, I don't have to jump in the car and do a two hour commute to uh, Manhattan or downtown LA. Uh, I can do, uh, it, uh, I, can, I can talk to my customer via, the, uh, via a, a video chat. So that's here to stay. And in fact, one of the things that's happening with remote work uh, from two perspectives, one, a lot of people aren't going to change jobs and go to another staffing company if they're not allowed to, to work, at least work uh, some of their uh, days ho at home. And then on the consultant side, uh, there are many consultants these days that are saying, uh, I will only take a job if I'm allowed to do it remotely. Uh, and that's opened up uh, middle America, uh, if you will, to uh, uh, people that, uh, that, you know, live in Boise, Idaho, for example, that have no desire to go to Manhattan or San Francisco or Dallas to do a gig, uh, but, uh, but the customer is perfectly comfortable with them doing a remote. Hmm. Some of the, um, um, anyway, th th those are some of the trends that I'm really seeing. Uh, what I'll say is one, one trend that I'm very excited about, and this has literally nothing to do with staffing, and, uh, uh, and that's uh, something called uh, mRNA, messenger RNA. For those of you that know what that is, uh, that was a technology that was used for the COVID vaccine. I have to tell you that uh, I was good in math and history and all that stuff in high school. Uh, I wasn't very good with biology, but I I read a book last fall called The Code Breaker uh, by Walter Isaacson, who's one of my favorite authors. Uh, 
And it's all about um, starting in 2012, 2013, the competitiveness and how messenger RNA uh, 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 developed and how that really brought the uh, on the COVID vaccine. And the reason I mentioned that is toward the end of the book, and it, it really just it, it really just hit me uh, 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 big time. It, it uh, he, he basically says the um, um, what microchips where they were in the late fifties and early sixties is where mRNA is right now. Uh, and uh, uh, you know digital uh, the digital revolution and the genetic revolution are marrying up. So obviously that has nothing to do with staffing uh, it per se, but it's fascinating. One of the uh, one of the worldwide innovations that's coming along. Yeah, that's super interesting. And it, it, coincidentally, I was recently reading an article about um, relating to mRNA about uh, I, I believe is, her name is Dr. Carico, um, where she basically has been working on this for many, many years, most of her career. And the, even when the grants were actually pulled and she didn't have any more funding to continue the research, uh, she actually still kept going and going uh, and proving the, that technology. So that, uh, that's been uh, kind of just very interesting how after so many years of development and research, it only came about just recently as an actual, you know, something that actually works. So. That definitely resonates on so many levels and you also talked a little briefly about you know the the challenges in the staffing space and talent acquisition um especially now with organizations opening up you know opportunities on a fully virtual scale uh which brings another set, set of challenges for for companies to be able to to operate and build um as well as lead high performing hybrid teams on a global scale whether you have you know fully virtual team or whether you have half on site on prem and half that are fully virtual curious to get your thoughts on that perspective as you perhaps consult with your client organizations from that standpoint what are some of the thoughts and some of the strategies that you share with them on building and leading high performing teams on that global scale well i actually do a lot of work um in that that's one of the 10 best practices is mm -hmm. uh, really two of them. Uh, they have strong uh, uh, people and team development systems uh, and they, they have good uh, effective hiring practices. And I'd love to talk about both um, as we go through uh, this afternoon. I think one of the cornerstones of success for, uh, for a growing company is to focus on high performance teams and high performance teams can be, it can be uh, uh, high performance teams can be your sales and recruiting teams. Uh, companies that thrive in this business, sales and recruiting work as partners, uh, and there's excellent teamwork. They push each other like good teammates should do, uh, but there's excellent teamwork. Um, uh, low performing teams, which can really be detrimental to a staffing company's growth, are uh, when sales blames recruiting, uh, when they don't get the fill and recruiting blames sales uh, for bringing in bad job orders, uh, uh, which is why they can't make any money. So high performance teams are that. I do a lot of work with uh, what I call leadership teams, which uh, uh, are executive teams. And uh, I actually have a survey that I do uh, with executive teams. And um, we use that as a basis for improving. So um, uh, I've got something I'm gonna read off fairly quickly um, or, or touch on very quickly which is the 10 characteristics of high performance teams. Um, in no particular order, number one, they understand the purpose of the team and are focused on results. Um, if you've got a, a, a leadership team and it's made up of the head of sales, the head of that branch, the head of recruiting, the CFO, the CEO, you know, with six or eight people on it, um, the, the team is the company. So they understand the purpose of the team and they're focused on results. There's a strong team culture with a general lack of a separate agenda. That really feeds into that as well. Um, I don't have an agenda where I'm gonna throw you under the bus, we're gonna to work together. High level of trust between teammates. I know that my teammates are gonna compliment, compliment me when I do a good job. And I also know that they'll professionally call me out when I need to do better. They follow team norms and are comfortable calling out non-norm behavior. I do a lot of work on, on something called what are the norms of conduct uh, on any team? Um, 
Uh, they're accountable to the team and support team decisions outside of the team. Um, one of the norms when I was in the business is um, speak up now if you disagree and we'll talk it through. We may agree to disagree and then as a team, we're gonna go in this direction. But once we do that, you support the decision. You don't need to say, I agreed with the way we're gonna move forward, but you need to say, but we talked about it uh, and I agree with the decision, or, or excuse me, I don't necessarily agree with it, but I support it. They're pra they, they practice and are good at open communication and productive conflict. I use productive conflict all the time. And that is conflict could be defined as when there's one or there's two or more uh, opinions on something. Uh, productive is we talk about it productively. Uh, I use the term be direct with respect. You need to know exactly where I'm coming from and how I'm feeling, but I'm gonna do it very respectfully. Um, when there's productive conflict, great things happen. They're made up uh, of and are tolerant of diverse styles within the team. You know, it, stereotypically, uh, you know, an entrepreneurial CEO is different from a, uh, from a CFO. Um, whether you could argue that their brains are made up differently, and we don't necessarily have to go there, but they have different ways of thinking and approaching things. Teams are very accepting. And in fact, the best teams are made up of people of all different types of, uh, of styles because it, it, it will bring out the best. Um, they're comfortable putting any issue on the table. I gotta tell you, uh, I've been in some, some, uh, some uh, leadership team meetings where some really tough issues got put on the table. Oftentimes about someone maybe even on the team that, that uh, probably was gonna be let go but you got to deal with it. You got to put tough issues on the table. When they meet, there's a general lack of hierarchy being observed. This starts with the owner or CEO sitting in the meeting. If he or she uh, uh, doesn't allow or people are not comfortable uh, disagreeing with him or her, all is lost. So uh, when you meet, uh, uh, in fact, there's something in the uh, uh, the, 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 uh, when you meet, you know, there could be two or three levels starting with the owner in the meeting. Egos are left at the door, ranks are left at the door, and everybody has an equal say, and everybody's very, very comfortable. In fact, I also do a lot of leadership training and uh, uh, what I, uh, or leadership coaching, what I uh, say to, the, if you're the leader in the room, give your opinion last. If you give it first, you're anybody, any subordinate in the room, even if they trust you, uh, has to uh, filter through their brain. Do I, do I want to disagree with Tom? Uh, so if you want to get the honest answers from someone, ask them their opinion first. Don't give your opinion first. Like and then that. last, last not, but not least, there's an ongoing assessment and continuing focus on how they, how they perform as a team and as individuals on the team. I said in my introduction that uh, I was uh, fortunate to be in a company that uh, grew from 25 to over 100 million. And I'll have to say, we put in an awful lot of work uh, developing uh, a high performance leadership team. And that was, uh, was certainly one of the most important reasons why we're able to grow. Um, I also use something when I'm, uh, 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 I could use this when I'm look when I'm helping someone hire somebody, or when uh, we talk about uh, um, self improvement, uh, because uh, uh, everybody should be spend a little bit of time on self improvement. But good teams are made up of people that uh, uh, have a trait called uh, vulnerability. Um, I like a particular definition of vulnerability that says uh, someone this comfortable being vulnerable is open to and capable of being emotionally wounded. Um, people in teams that accept uh, vulnerability as a valuable trait, uh, um, uh, people that, that are comfortable being vulnerable, it's easy for them uh, to say, I don't know the answer, I made a mistake, I need help, your idea is better than mine. And from a team perspective, teams that are comfortable with being vulnerable can say, we're not doing a very good job with that. We need to change the way we're doing something. Uh, we made a terrible mistake and we've got to fix it. Uh, someone that's incapable of being, being vulnerable, uh, and we've all been around them in our lives, uh, um, 
uh, they, they, they've always got the right answer. They'll never say, I'm sorry. And uh, so vulnerability is an absolute uh, key trait. Um, and to, to improve on almost anything, and I use this uh, in my personal life, my professional life, and in my coaching life, um, the concept of get comfortable being uncomfortable. Hmm. And anybody that's uh, listening to this podcast, jot that down. It is so, so important. Uh, and, you know, the way I think about that, and I, you know, I oftentimes have to really think about this, uh, is when I've got to approach something that makes me really nervous, I really don't want to deal with it. Um, you know, it could be if I'm in the business, uh, having a hard conversation with someone that doesn't take hard conversations very well. Then I sometimes uh, uh, I might ask advice of somebody. Sometimes I might look up something, even an article, uh, you know, on how to approach this. But then, you know, I take some deep breaths and I go and I approach it. Um, and I, I, I approach something in the way that I that uh, either I've learned how to approach it. And I'm usually uh, come away from that saying, wow, um, uh, uh, that worked a whole lot better than, uh, than I might have anticipated. Uh, and I'm, that, I'm incrementally more comfortable to deal with that the next time around. One of the things that uh, is very common is uh, someone that's a leader that chooses uh, something called harmony over conflict. Uh, so, that, so they will... Uh, They'll push conflict under the rug because they're not comfortable dealing with, dealing with that. The more comfortable that they get with how to deal with anybody, how to call someone out you know, politely, uh, I call it direct with respect. Um, and they, the, the more comfortable they are at, at dealing with accountability and letting someone know exactly uh, where they need to get better. I think all of these things take practice and focus. Uh, but results can be very, very significant, both personally uh, from a self-improvement perspective and from a team improvement perspective. Right, right, absolutely. Um, and when it, when it comes to, you know, talent acquisition, especially in the past couple of years, has been, of, you know, top of the minds for a lot of executives at organizations of various size, um, because thinking that, now we're shifting fully virtual environments. Um, things may get easier, but at the same time, the competition 10x with organizations targeting, you know, very similar, if not the same skill set. Um, but when we add another layer of complexity to that, when it comes to retaining that top talent, is a completely different side of the spectrum. What are your thoughts on that? How do you, how do you, what are some of the strategies that you you provide or recommend to some of your portfolio companies when it comes to retaining the top talent in this highly competitive environment? Well, I think it, it's a great it's a great question. It's something that uh, a lot of folks uh, do well and some and some folks struggle with. Um, and I'll try to keep the answer relatively short. I could probably talk for a couple of hours on this because it's it's a it's very very important. And the the trend right now is um, that. Um, there's a lot of people available on the market that have great looking resumes, uh, but they're really not very good. We're gonna, I think we're gonna talk a little later on about hiring best practice, uh, practices, so I'll get more into that. But the way to keep top talent, uh, one is you gotta pay them competitively. Um, and I'm a big believer. I do a ton of compensation planning in my, in my business. Um, and I've seen probably a thousand different compensation plans, uh, some of them good, some of them absolutely terrible. But in my mind, someone that we want to attract, particularly from a producer, a sales or recruiter, um, salary is important to them, but it's not the most important. The upside is what's most important. Um, so, you know, you got to have a decent market salary. Uh, but it's 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 the upside. I want to attract people to say, you know, I'm happy coming in for a sixty thousand dollars salary, but I want to make three hundred sixty thousand. So tell me more about your commission plan if I can really produce. So you want to have a good competitive commission plan that has unlimited upside for people that can produce. Uh, another aspect is what is your culture like? You know, we talked about culture, and I do I do surveys on those best practices and. Um, uh, and I might, uh, someone might give straight, you know, A plus to our culture, and I'll say why, and they'll say because it's it's fun, it's ethical, uh, it's a happy place to work, 
Um, and those are certainly uh, 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 important aspects of a culture. But I just have to really probe a little bit before they, they uh, you know, they'll, they'll say, oh, maybe, maybe I give myself a B or a B minus. I'll say, is, is, your, is your culture highly accountable? Do people do what they're expected to do? And when they don't, um, when they do, are they rewarded? Uh, not just compensation wise, but uh, with uh, recognition wise. When they don't, are they gently at first and then strongly, if it doesn't work, uh, told that their job is on the line if they don't do better? Uh, one, of the, one of the common things, uh, which is terrible in our industry is, if you're a million dollar producer, you're the best salesperson in the company, but you're absolutely obnoxious. Uh, and uh, recruiters love you when they're placing your people because they're making money off you. They can't stand you when you're telling, when, 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 the, when the salesperson is, uh, is yelling and screaming at them. Well, owners that let their best producers money-wise stay, stay on the bus, begin to lose some really decent people because your culture is if you produce great dollars, you can break the rules. You don't have to follow the rules. You can be a lousy teammate because I'm addicted to your dollars. Uh, that's not good. So, so you'll lose people if, you, if you're... Uh, also, good people, great people want to be surrounded by good and great people. And that gets into your hiring best practices. Uh, you know, you could get into things like uh, what kind of flexibility does someone have to work remotely? That's a relatively uh, recent uh, you know, trend, which we just talked about. But I think that the, um, if someone is making good money, they feel well-paid, particularly with their upside. They think they've got a decent salary. They love the culture because it is fun and it, it is ethical, but they're surrounded by other fun and ethical people and good teammates. Uh, and it's an accountable culture, um, uh, you're not going to lose, uh, you know, that many people. Um, and uh, so that, that's, that's really one of the ways I look at that. One of the trends that uh, not, not a week goes by that I don't hear someone talking about it. It used to be, going back a couple of years, that, uh, uh, you know, your, your B and C players on the recruiting side would go to corporate America, and they go from making a $60,000 salary and maybe they're making 20,000 in commissions because they're not all that good. And they go for an $85,000 salary at ABC Corp. They become a corporate recruiter. So we used to lose the people that wanted the high salary, not much upside. Um, and most people said, you know, nice person, but they weren't a great recruiter. Good luck. Uh, now they're losing some darn good recruiters uh, that are going for, you know, 100, 130, 150 to uh, Facebook and those places. And what I can tell you is that's a tough, uh, a tough pill to swallow. But I've yet to talk with the CEO that said, I'm going to match that person's uh, salary at 130,000. Um, I don't know if that trend will continue. I was talking to someone the other day that said, uh, you know, someone went for a pretty big salary, uh, you know, uh, nine months ago to corporate America. Um, the owner was keeping up with that person that said, I put 26 people to work in the last six months. Um, and uh, uh, basically what it came down to uh, was, okay, I got 26 resumes uh, because it was a well-known company. I got, I got a thousand resumes. I sorted through a bunch of them. I passed them on to the hiring manager. Uh, and I, I got 26 starts, uh, no commissions, but 26 starts. So uh, I don't want to say that uh, recruiters in corporate America aren't any good. Uh, that's not what I'm trying to say. I'm just saying that uh, recruiters uh, that are money motivated and want unlimited upside, uh, same thing with sales. So um, anyway, I don't want to get too long winded on that, but it's definitely a trend. Uh, but, um, you know, your culture uh, and uh, how good or how not good it is, is an absolute uh, um, important thing to, to retaining, retaining your talent. Right. Absolutely. No, that makes perfect sense. And with the amount of research, uh, and you know, that you do for your line of work, I'm curious to get, uh, an insight into, into your content diet or information diet that you prescribe to what are the different sources that you consume on daily basis to keep yourself informed and educated and know things going on in, in your space? Well, it's the, um, 
I got to think about that. The uh, I don't watch a lot of TV. Uh, I've got nothing against TV. Uh, I just don't watch a lot of it. I'd rather be buried in a book. I read at least two or three books a month. Um, I, uh, uh, I have a combination. I love historical fiction. Um, I read more than my fair share of spy thrillers uh, <laughs> for fun. Uh, and then I, I try to read at least two a quarter, just books on self-improvement or things that I can use to help in my consulting business. Uh, so I read a lot. Um, the internet, I don't know what I did before the internet. Um, I'm obviously old enough to remember before uh, uh, there was an internet, uh, but um, it is so easy just to Google something. Uh, and I probably have a thousand documents that I've downloaded. Uh, I'm very careful to put the title of the document and the author because I never want anybody to think that I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I'm the author. But I probably have well over a thousand documents that are one or two pages long that I've got all organized by subject that I can look at at any time. And I use it all the time. But uh, I was just reading one today on uh, uh, what, what do, it was a two-page document. Uh, in fact, I'll give it to uh, everybody on the podcast. I got to find it. Um, Google, 12 powerful habits of a lifelong learner. It's going to show up on page one. It's by a gentleman who I don't know uh, named Oscar Nowick, N-O-W-I-C. And it, it uh, you know, number one, I read on a daily basis. Number two, I attend various courses. Number three, they actively seek opportunities to grow. Google it and take a look at that and circle the ones that you do uh, and, um, and the ones that you don't do, but you might want to do. Um, so that's, uh, you know, the, the um, and I, I think one of my probably most important things uh, that is just in my DNA and I think I got this, I know I got this from my dad. Uh, I'm infinitely curious. I love to learn. I'm a lifelong learner. I know more useless trivia uh, than, uh, than uh, most people, but I also know some very, very interesting things I consider very, very interesting. So uh, not a day goes by that, that I don't learn something. Uh, and uh, uh, by the way, when, uh, if, if uh, I think that's one of the absolute key areas to probe on when you're interviewing people to hire. Mm -hmm. One of the other trends in the industry to go off on a tangent for a second is a lot of companies are no longer hiring uh, saying you got to have a uh, talent acquisition experience because there's so many rejects that have a great look and resume, but they've run out of gas and they come in for these big guarantees and they don't produce anything. So the other trend, uh, which is very interesting uh, is a lot of the real big companies historically would hire people right out of college. They do a lot of campus recruiting. Even that is becoming less and less common. So the trend that I'm seeing very distinctly, whether it's a very large company or even small companies, is I'm looking for someone that might be two, three, four years out of college. Uh, because people coming right out of college, oftentimes it takes them a year to figure out what they really want to do with their careers. So you run the risk of them saying, well, you know, staffing's not for me. So bringing someone in that's got two, three, four years, sometimes more, maybe they were in a hype, uh, uh, um, uh, a sales function that had to dial all day and meet people and all that, and then you can bring them on. But I think that they're looking for more generic skills, someone that's got this curious, someone that likes to learn, someone that is has high EQ. By the way, if you don't know what EQ is, people that are listening, it's emotional intelligence, and it's one of the more fascinating uh, things you're going to you're going to uh, look at. EQ in, in general is someone with as high an EQ uh, is superb at understanding how someone likes to be dealt with within the first thirty seconds of meeting you, and that's how they tailor their interaction. They're very likable, they easily connect, uh, and they can hold on a conversation uh, with almost anybody. Uh, tell me that that doesn't fit someone that's a great recruiter or a great salesperson in our industry. So yeah. someone that's got high uh, EQ, someone that's got great motivators, they can articulate their motivators, and someone that uh, uh, can, can convince you they like to learn, 
I also like to probe on vulnerability. Again, we could go on and on and on on the, you know, what are the, what are the <laughs> for great, sure. What are we the can probably do a we can probably do a round two on that specific <laughs> uh, on that specific topic, which is definitely very fascinating, very interesting. So I appreciate you bringing that up. And Tom, in conclusion, what what is one book that you always recommend to others, and why is that? Well, the um, I had a hard time on that one because I was doing a little prep on some of the questions I knew you were going to ask me. And um, when it comes to um, something that would be good for you and good for your company, how about I narrow it down to uh, my favorite author and, and two of my favorite books. Uh, Patrick Lencioni uh, is, I've read every one of his books going back 20, 25 years. My two favorites are The Ideal Team Player, which he came out with maybe five years ago. You got to read the book and you got to Google ideal team player and you could uh, get some uh, stuff on there on uh, how do you interview for the ideal team player uh, and uh, uh, how do you assess. And the, se the second one that he wrote that I is probably my second favorite is the five dysfunctions, excuse me, the five temptations of a CEO, but it's really the five temptations of anybody uh, that uh, deals with others. So uh, uh, how's that? I narrowed it down to one author and two of my favorite books from that author. I love it. And definitely can't go wrong with Lencioni's books. Uh, always a great treat. Tom, can't thank you enough for your time today. It was very short and insightful conversation, at least for me. You were very generous with the information that you have shared. Uh, what I like doing with all the podcast guests is do a follow-up recording in about a year where we revisit the conversation from a year ago and see if everything that we've discussed still makes sense, still applies. So I'm definitely looking forward to doing that with you as well. Great. Thank you very much.